I'm Jerit Katarze. I'm the head of labor at UN Global Compact, and I'm very glad to see you all here to be part of the discussion this morning. I'm very pleased that we will have today some of the companies joining us, speaking on their commitments that they already took on living wage as part of the Forward Faster. So they are our early movers. And we're also joined by some speakers from international organizations, organizations that are also supporting the Global Compact in helping companies to implement these commitments. Living wage is a human right. And living wage is also an essential aspect of decent work. So if we want to achieve the SDGs, we need to take action on living wage. I hope that you will hear and learn a lot during the session today, and that you are also convinced to join the Forward Faster Commitments on Living Wage. I'm very pleased to introduce our moderator of today, Caroline Rees, who is the president and co-founder of SHIFT. So I'm happy to hand it over to Caroline for our first three speakers. Caroline, over to you. Thank you so much, Kate. Um, and it's a delight and pleasure to be here with all of you for this conversation. As Kate says, I'm the president of SHIFT, which is a not-for-profit, not mission-driven organization dedicated to working with all of the partners, business and finance and governments and civil society organizations to embed respect for human rights into how business gets done. And as Preet says, the living wage itself is a human right, not just a nice to have, not just a foundation for human development and opportunity, but a human right itself. And so that's really what we're here to talk about. How do we move towards a world where all workers can at least earn a living wage enough to sustain themselves and their family in a basic decent standard of living and it's really welcome and significant that in this opening conversation we're going to hear remarks from leaders from the international labor organization the international trade union confederation and the international organization of employers so the three key voices and venues collectives uh, for government business and labor to talk about wages and wage policies so Patrick, let's kick off. I'd love to start with you. Um, the ILO, a place not least where governments come together and governments have a critical role to play uh, on this question of wages. Uh, they have a critical role in wage setting mechanisms at national level, industry uh, level very often. I think there are over 170 countries now that have at least one legally defined minimum wage. But we're talking here about living wages. So just say a bit, if you would, about the distinction between minimum and living wages and why it matters. Thank you very much and uh, good morning to all the participants. And uh, uh, let me start by saying that I'm, I'm very happy that we have this panel as a, uh, where we are going to hear also the voices of the, of the social partners, the trade unions, the employers organizations. And you know that uh, the ILO is a tripartite organization, so uh, we value social dialogue and, uh, and we, we are looking for solutions to challenges in the, in the world of work that comes through dialogue between governments and uh, trade unions and employers' organizations. So uh, when it comes to the question of living wages, I think the, particularly the, the question about the definition is important. Um, and it's very important to have definitions clear when we want to dis distinguish what is a minimum wage from what is a living wage. So a living wage is generally defined as a wage which is sufficient in a particular place to afford a decent standard of living for a worker and her or his family. So this is very much an idea, the idea that a wage is uh, should be sufficient for a decent standard of life. It's, uh, if you want, a social uh, definition of, of uh, wage. Now, the question is very often asked, if so many countries have minimum wages, why do we need to have this debate on living wages? And I would say uh, two things about this. First of all, uh, minimum wages, uh, don't function adequately in many countries across the world. So we've done a lot of research about minimum wages and we've seen that um, even though they exist in a large ma majority of uh, ILO countries, they are not adjusted. Uh, half of the countries don't adjust them every two years or less. Some adjust them every five years, every 10 years. There are also many minimum wage systems that exclude 
vulnerable uh, populations like uh, domestic workers or workers in agriculture. So there is a lot uh, that can be done in the area of minimum wages to make them more adequate and to improve them. Now, there is something else to be said, is that minimum wages, like all wages, need to be set by taking into account the needs of workers and their families and economic factors, economic realities, and the capacity to pay of enterprises. This is the whole art of adequate wage setting, is you take into account the perspectives of the workers, the perspectives of the sustainable enterprises. And so what we see also is that in many countries, even though they may have good minimum wage systems, they may adjust their minimum wage every year, they simply cannot afford a minimum wage which is at the level of a living wage. And so I would say this is also one important reason why uh, there, is a, there is a need for voluntary initiatives that can uh, contribute to making living wages happen, uh, especially in, uh, in sectors or in enterprises where the capacity to pay is sometimes higher than, than it is in many of the local SMEs and uh, in the national economy where minimum wages are set. So very importantly, um, what I've said about minimum wage, I think I should say also about collective bargaining. In, uh, collective bargaining can be a very important instrument to promote and arrive at living wages. Uh, unfortunately, not all countries have very strong collective bargaining systems. And here too, there is a lot more that could be done to strengthen the social dialogue, the collective bargaining in order to reach to the point of a living wage. Well, thank you, Patrick, for that. And, and Luke, I'll turn to you as the Acting General Secretary of the ITUC, because Patrick's talked about those distinctions between minimum and living wages and that minimum wages are often not meeting the needs of workers, but also he's raised this issue around social dialogue, yep. right? Collective bargaining, tripartite dialogue. Bring, if you would, for the audience, your perspective indeed uh, on that issue and uh, on what it is that's needed to get us to living wages and to secure that role for social dialogue. Yeah. Um, first of all, I would like to repeat what has been said in the introduction. Uh, living wage is a human right. Eh? Um, so, and this uh, is um, today happening in a, in, in, in a context of uh, probably uh, one of the most important cost of living crises that we see in the uh, that we have seen in the last uh, years, uh, where many um, families don't have uh, any more the income uh, to make ends meet at the end of the month. Uh, we see an eroding purchasing power all over the world as well. So workers are suffering, and sometimes families are suffering even with two incomes. So for us as International Trade Union Confederation, as trade unions, living wage and equal pay for equal work for, of equal value, for me, it's all on the same um, basket. It's a priority for uh, our uh, trade union movement. And yes, um, social dialogue and collective bargaining um, must be uh, the first driver of setting uh, living wages. Uh, but as also already uh, mentioned, um, in many countries, um, the capacity of social partners to discuss and to exchange and to do collective bargaining is not there uh, because of weak employer organizations or very fragmented and also weak trade unions. So from both sides, we don't have often in many countries globally the, the conditions to do uh, effective collective bargaining. Or second point, there is no legal framework in the country to implement the results of collective bargaining. So you need also um, there the, the results or the, the framework so uh, if you don't have the, um, the, the, the collective bargaining structure, then you indeed go to legal minimum wage setting and countries do that as well. Uh, and then we have in uh, Europe, for instance, now the uh, minimum wage directive, which sets adequate minimum wages as a kind of next step uh, for um, uh, reaching that. But at the end of the day, and I would like to emphasize this, it's all about also companies' behavior and companies' choices. So, and I must say clearly here that a race to the bottom approach is, in our opinion, not combinable with a living wage ambition. So if a company says we want to go for the cheapest price in our um, supply chain, well, our, our experience shows us that this is not combinable with a living wage ambition. Uh, secondly, there is a uh, responsibility for multinational companies for their supply chains. Uh, they are complex, uh, they have been made complex to indeed go for the cheapest price. 
Um, and so we cannot ignore the responsibility of major companies for what's happening in their supply chain. So you can't tell me or you can't tell the public we didn't know because we are not the employer. No, it's your supply chain. You are responsible for what's happening in your supply chain. I can go into details when it's about the garment sector, but what I've seen in the garment sector indeed is such a complex supply chain where there is a race to the bottom and it's still going on. Yeah, despite good intentions by major players, and I don't name any name here, but it's still going on, uh, this race to the bottom. To conclude, we are very happy about this initiative, but it remains a voluntary initiative. So we see what's happening now in the European context on um, adequate minimum wages. We see what's coming up on due diligence. Well, we believe that these are important steps. Um, but my first choice is indeed a voluntary approach that is effective because at the end of the day, it can only be successful if it changed the reality for people on the ground. So it is a human right. It should apply to all workers, living wages, also platform workers, domestic workers, and so on, people that are in our supply chains. Do know that living wage is also a boost uh, for economy because in it increases the purchasing power of everyone, and that's a boost for, uh, for production and for economy. And um, yeah, uh, let's be clear, we as trade unions, we are ready to step into partnerships. We have done that already. Uh, with companies and uh, with sectors uh, in different regions to step into pre uh, partnerships for living wages and we will continue to do that. But at the end of the day, I can only hope that companies uh, take real action on living wages because at the end of the day, the key for a solution is in their hands. Thank you, Luke. And already we get to that call for action. But Roberta, let me come to you. You're the Secretary General of the International Organization of Employers. Um, and bringing indeed that other perspective, we've heard about social dialogue, that's a multi-stakeholder approach um, and it's bringing the different voices to the table and we hear the challenges that come along with that as well. But give us your perspective from the IOE standpoint on the role of this multi-stakeholder approach in moving us uh, towards uh, deeper conversations on wage policies. Well, rather than multi-stakeholder approach, uh, setting the salaries is a tripartite and that's bipartite issue. You know, it's workers, employers, and uh, of course, the role of governments is very important. It's an area where, of course, we have been working since more than 100 years. Uh, and all, as you all rightly said, is uh, recognizing the Universal Declaration of Human Rights and also many instruments of ILO. We have had this discussion on living wages already for, for a while. And I remember with the predecessor of Luke, uh, Sharon Barroa, we have a very, very intense debate during the centenary of the ILO because the reality is that it's true that in some countries the minimum wage is not good enough and and, you, and the ILO has recently published a, a report a brief report which is very yeah. very enlightening what's going on with the with the minimum wage why they have you know, some weak elements where we have to make a difference uh, and we agreed uh, in this centenary declaration that uh, where there are minimum wage which are not sufficient, we had to do and we have to make an effort. And that's where the idea of adequate minimum wages came, where you were referring to, Luke, and is now in the Centennial Declaration and is taken by the EU Directive. So there, as you said, there are two elements. On one side, we have to assure workers and their families an income, eh? but also we have to bear in mind what are the capacities of the, of the con, of the, especially the small and medium companies the productivity and the employment angle, which is not minor. Also, especially in a context of inflation, you have also to bear that into consideration. But you have to be responsible as business organization. Um, beyond that, you have companies that in a, I would say, in a very committed and responsible manner are pushing also for living wages, and we are also engaging with them. Uh, it's true, look, you said they have the responsibility of course, they have the responsibility. They have to engage in their own operations. Then the supply chain is more complex. Uh, and the results of the due diligence process, well, it's, it's not easy. But what is going to make a difference is whether the policies of industrial relations with the minimum wages are really uh, applying to all the workers. And that also combines what we call, we call the minimum income. Sometimes you have the wage, but you also have incomes from the public authorities for health, for you know, for uh, education, that makes also a difference. Working all together, I can give you examples where we have pushed together, international trade union, IOE, but also the ILO to have better minimum wages. I mean, in countries like Cambodia, for instance, 
we, we give a push and things improve. Uh, and I will, will not say that the situation is perfect. Some other orga employers organizations, business organizations, are also pushing in, in difficult contexts. I give you the example of the Mexican employer, Mexican business. They're pushing for higher minimum wages. And you have also, in this context of inflation, some good deals uh, of between employers and workers at uh, national level to foresee a scenario of wage increases in a three years time, which is very responsible on one side trying to, uh, to preserve the capacity of workers, but on the other side. So those are the, those are the, the elements that will make also a difference. If you have efficient partnerships on one side between uh, trade unions and employers and business organizations, but on the other side, a kind of a sense of responsibility also for, you know, you, you call it other stakeholders, I mean, the, the, the companies themselves, but also the government. That's where the driver of change starts. Well, that's a fantastic and really capturing that sense of dialogue that has to underpin all of this. And I know in the ILO, this dialogue is going to be continuing in the months ahead. Um, can I invite you all please to express your thanks to our opening speakers for so well setting our landscape here for this conversation. Um, and as our opening speakers leave the platform, our panel speakers are going to come up here and join me. And while we're doing that change of, of chairs up here, we have the opportunity to see a short video from the Global Compact about living wages and importantly about the targets on living wages that we are here to talk about today. So please panelists come up and join me and our tech colleagues will be showing you a video shortly. Reducing inequalities in the labor market and improving living standards of the most vulnerable amongst us, including those living in poverty, is an overarching theme across all of the UN Sustainable Development Goals. While inequality has been part of our societies over the ages, we've reached a critical juncture. A number of major trends and developments are making the situation work. With rising inflation and a global cost of living crisis, workers around the world are struggling to meet their basic needs. Both governments and companies have responsibility to ensure living wages which should be grounded in social dialogue and collective bargaining. Today, over a billion working people worldwide are estimated to earn less than they need for a decent standard of living. This includes sufficient food, water, housing, education, healthcare, transportation, clothing and other essential needs, an amount known as a living wage or a living income. A living wage or living income is a benchmark income level that allows people to enjoy a decent standard of living as stated in Article 25 of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. The push for a living wage is a response to the fact that legally set minimum wages often fail to meet workers' needs. They often fall below human rights standards, are not always consistently enforced, are frequently set without extensive social dialogue and not adjusted frequently enough to keep up with inflation. Key stakeholders including governments and the private sector, must work together in driving the living wage agenda to ensure that all employees have the income to support their needs and those of their dependents. Employing two-thirds of the world's wage-earning population, the private sector has a critical role to play. Ambitious action from businesses is needed to ensure that all employees have the income to support their needs and those of their dependents raising standards of health and well-being. But when companies start working on the topic of living wages, they quickly understand that besides the moral imperative of the topic, there are numerous benefits associated to living wages, such as greater productivity, lower turnover, stronger worker commitment, and a better quality of life that contributes to stronger communities. Companies can add on the living wage agenda by making concrete commitments to assume their responsibility to their own employees and by working with the relevant stakeholders. The UN Global Compact encourages businesses to sign on to our living wage campaign, committing to a living wage for 100% of your workforce and engaging your supply chains to advance a living wage for all workers. The living wage targets of the Forward Faster are essential to driving actions on the SDGs ahead of the 2030 deadline and tackling inequalities around the world. Through this initiative, 
companies can demonstrate their dedication to advancing the living wage economy. Together we can send a strong signal that there is a greater understanding today of the business case for a living wage. And through the Forward Faster, we can work together towards a world where workers everywhere can realistically expect that their hard work will be rewarded sufficiently. We urge you to join us. The time for action is now. Well, and thank you to the Global Compact for that. You can see we've got a packed stage up here now. I'll stand so that I can actually see all of you. And uh, as we get into our conversation and start to talk about some of the practical realities of working towards living wages, I'll introduce each of our panelists as well. But just to take a moment to reflect on what we're talking about here. Um, there are over 1 billion workers around the world. That's a third of all workers today who are not earning enough to make ends meet for themselves and their family. They're not earning a living wage. And we know this is a critical underlying factor as well to the growing um, nature of inequalities uh, in our societies around the world with all of the effects that that has on social cohesion and social stability, the political backlash as well. So this is a critical issue underpinning our societies and economies. What we're talking about here today is about companies making ambitious and credible commitments to make progress towards living wages. We're talking about doing so in a way that is measurable and where companies can report on their progress. And that has to reflect also that this isn't simple and we'll hear more about that, that there may be setbacks and challenges along the way. But part of what the Forward Faster initiative offers for participants, for companies that sign up and make that bold commitment is a platform where they can talk about the action that they're taking, where they can collaborate precisely with others on tackling those challenges, on dealing with those barriers to progress um, as they come up, and where through collective action, they can achieve greater impact individually as well as collectively. So that's our call to action today, to join and sign up to these two key targets we have, achieving 100% of employees being on living wages by 2030, our SDGs deadline, and working uh, to develop plans for contractors uh, and into supply chain, supply chain partners for those workers also to move towards and achieve uh, living wages. We also know that there are considerable benefits to business of making progress in this arena. Across the arena of sustainability, we see a variety of benefits to business that stand up and make that difference. But here in the living wage arena, we've got evidence and research that's really brought that into sharp relief. And so before I turn to our panelists for a conversation, we actually want to take a quick poll of all of you in the audience. You can see that coming up there. But what are your experiences directly or what have you heard and seen elsewhere um, that uh, indicates what the benefits to business of paying a living wage might be? I think you've all seen, I can see some of you taking a picture of that QR code to get into Slido if you're not already in there. I'm going to invite you over the next minute to just share with us your thoughts on the key benefits to business of paying a living wage. So please get pressing. Uh, as you do so, I'd love to bring to your attention a report that came out last year um, called The Case for Living Wages. If you haven't already pulled it up, please do go have a look at that. It was developed by Business Fights Poverty, the Cambridge Institute for Sustainability Leadership, Harvard Kennedy School. My own organization had a small role in, in that, but I really do recommend that as a place to find empirical evidence um, and reports directly from companies as to the benefits that they see. So we're seeing there, well, quite a lot of support for a number of these benefits that you, you've been witnessing or experiencing, um, that increase in retention and motivation rising to the top at the moment, but closely followed by others, including the reduction in staff turnover. Well, so importantly, this conversation is not just an out there conversation, right? We're standing here in the United States. We can tend to think, oh, well, this is not about large companies. It's about uh, other parts of the world. It's about companies in supply chains. It's not maybe about developed economies. It's about other parts of the world. But of course, that's not true. Um, and I certainly in our work, we, we haven't met a multinational company that's actually taken the time to look internally and not found that there are workers there within their literal and metaphorical four walls who are not yet on a living wage. 
Um, and Sami, you're the Chief Sustainability Officer with UPM and you've done that hard work. You've started to say, let's look inside. Let's assume that that's the place to start. So I'd love to have you kick us off to tell us a little bit about how you took your steps on that journey, looking at your own workforce and the living wage and perhaps also what you might say to other companies to encourage them to do the same. All right. We started it officially something like three years ago. Wanted to kind of took a look on, on our home base. Uh, we did it by revising our social responsibility targets. We added a new focus area, fair rewarding, started to have a living wage for own employees and then equal pay. On that time, it was kind of difficult for us, but nowadays for you, it's self-evident that this is important. But we started the journey already in 2017. We did a cap analysis for our human rights activities and the terms were not familiar for us. So actually we turned to professionals. We started to work shift. Well, a bit marketing here, quality. Then uh, afterwards, so since we started, uh, it became kind of self-evident that we need to do it by learning by doing. Nowadays, six years after we started, we have a clear process. We have process owner. I'm not the process owner, it's the HR. They have the global team for rewarding. They have a global database. They have the system and they have the partners who actually know the local things, they know the regional things. And we have more than 55 sites, 47 nationalities. So this is the way to do it. But then at the same time, so when we have been proceeding, we know now that we have a robust system. We have audited it as a part of our assurance. But some learnings from our side. So first of all, well, introvert Finns, we want to do everything by ourselves, but don't do. So second marketing, we actually joined the Global Compacts, the Decent Work Action Platform, the Living Wage Platform, and we've shared information with our colleagues in here, what we did well, where were the challenges, and even where did we fail? Because it's self-evident journey. And kind of my last guidance for you, don't do it like we did it. As a pragmatic Finns, we wanted to have a third decimal in place, wanted to have everything perfect. Just get it started. Go forward faster. Thank you. Fantastic, Sammy. So those internal systems and you leveraging those collective action with others and just get started. Don't make the perfect the enemy of the good. Um, Alexandra, I'd love to turn to you. You're the Chief Responsibility Officer at L'Oreal and also the Chair of the L'Oreal Foundation. Um, take us forward in thinking about how L'Oreal has looked at this in the context of strategy on living wages and how your strategy around living wages um, uh, relates to other strategies and programs as you think holistically about the improvement of working conditions more broadly, if you would. Uh, yes, uh, hello. Uh, thank you for having us. So I, I think what is important is, well, it's always the same, is the top sets the tone. So either you have leadership or you don't have it. And if you don't have it, you have to make it exist and so how how do we do we, we what was very i remember a conversation you know because we are not just doing it internally we are doing it in our supply chain and i remember the first conversation some years ago where of course people ask themselves but how are we going to be competitive in a system where others don't pay living wages and I think what was very interesting, I remember the CEO saying at that time, guys, um, just to make it clear, I don't feel comfortable with not having living wages for my people or the people who work for us in a way or in another. And so I think the first thing always is that kind of leadership. You cannot do it with that, without that kind of leadership. How can you imagine, you know, I have that conversations very often, especially in the US, you know, where market economy seems to justify everything that you can do or, you know, and everything is, what is the business opportunity, you know? So first thinking is what is the kind of society we want to build, the kind of society we want to operate in, and this kind of society in which we can operate. And I think a society in which people cannot live from the work they do for us is not a society in which we can thrive altogether. And then the rest comes afterwards. So I think that kind of very clear leadership 
is everywhere the same. And then, of course, we partners with Fair Wage Network. So we start, we close the gap where there have been gaps internally uh, for some years now. And we have started to work with our suppliers. And um, that is, of course, another question because, uh, as somebody said, uh, the system was designed to not pay enough to people because market economy justifies everything. So um, we have to make it clear now that if you want to work with L'Oreal in 2030, you pay living wages to your employees. But it's not just about putting that target. We also want to help the company people in that. And so we make available methodology, help in the gap analyze it, tell how we did it, try to work with our suppliers in order to make it done. So we can recognize those challenges, but not as excuses, rather than as, as things to push into because we were aiming at a, a value, right? That everyone should earn a living wage. Alexandra, thank you for that. Michael, I'd love to come to you um, because as a Chief Sustainability Officer at McCormick, you have a supply chain that is agricultural. Um, so you're looking, as you look at the flavors and the spices and everything else that you source at farmers. And, and there the conversation isn't so much about paying wages, it's about prices that reach a farmer's pocket and therefore how you think about the income, the living income that a farmer can earn. So just say a word if you would about that distinction when you're looking at living income and perhaps an example about how you've been working on this at McCormick alongside your sustainable agricultural practices. First, thank you very much for having me. It's really exciting to see uh, uh, the uh, work that uh, UNGC is doing as a whole, as a catalyst for this journey that we are on on this uh, planet. So um, McCormick just to put it in context, is uh, the king of flavors. So if you like uh, healthy things, it's herbs and spices. It doesn't get any better. I keep telling the story that when I was growing up uh, in Nigeria in a farming community, my mom was a farmer. And if you had any disease, she has a herb or a spice that will cure you. It's as simple as that. And I still think it's true today. If you want to talk about healthy things, it's what we do. But here's the deal. You talked about over a billion people not really receiving a, li a living wage or living income. But before I get to the distinction, do you realize, I'm talking to the audience, that majority of that billion people are in smallholder farming communities. And those farming communities where all this great stuff McCormick Health comes from are in the global south. That's something they have in common. And they didn't do anything to cause the damage that we're seeing today because of climate change, or in some cases, climate burning now. Uh, but they are bearing the brunt of it. So that's where we step in. If you look at us, everything we, we source from over 85 different countries. And those countries, as I said, are in the global south. But these are smallholder farmers. These, they don't earn wages. So the distinction I'm going to make is really expanding the conversation. So a living wage is what you and I make here in the developed economies. In the farming community, they make an in income once a year in most cases, once a year. And they have to manage it through what they call the lean season. That's income, living income. So the key is when we talk about living wage, let's not stay focus on the Western part. We can control that with all the laws and everything. There are no laws there. It's your thing. So the point is we have to really address that. The second thing is if you want to have a thriving world, those farming communities, they still produce a majority of the food we eat. We have to really support them. So here's what my comic is doing. First of all, we didn't start by just going to do stuff. We created a strategy we call purpose-led performance. And that strategy is about delivering top-tier financial performance while doing the right thing for people, for communities, and the planet we share. And when it comes to communities, it's communities where we live, communities where we work, but most importantly, communities where we source. So that gives you the basic framework of what we're trying to do. And then the next step is you look at those farming communities, there's a lot of predatory activities. These women owning farms, who in some cases were non-existent. By the way, if you grew up in a farming community like I did, this will sound familiar. When I was growing up and, and uh, most of the farms were owned by men, majority of the workers were, were women. You wanna talk about the injustice? That's the crux of it. And we set out to change that. So one of the things we did is we said, one, we're going to remove the predatory activities in those areas because you can talk, but if you don't do something that you can control, then you're not going to help them. So we aggregated these communities in what we call cooperatives. 
By the way, we are not experts in cooperative, so you cannot use the excuse, oh, I don't have expertise. No, go get the experts. We partnered with CARE and uh, NCB Eclusa, which is an NGO that builds cooperatives. And they now created cooperatives in those regions, in Madagascar, in Indonesia, in, in Thailand, in, uh, uh, in India. And those uh, uh, cooperatives are functioning as self-governing, that's one. Two, they set their own prices, I say cooperative, because it's different from a living wage where unions can set the prices. They don't have union there, but the cooperatives now in the farming communities have the uh, power to set the prices, and we're enabling them. Three, they eliminate those predatory activities because the way things go is you have like a thousand farmers in a village, they farm, they sell to a middleman in the village, that middleman sells to another middleman, to another middleman before he gets to our export partner. In the process, these farmers are impoverished. But when you eliminate those people, oh, by the way, and those middle men, and I use my word purposefully, they are all men, at least as much as I know, and they are driving Mercedes-Benz cars and living in fancy houses. This is the fact. So when you eliminate that, you have a lot, of, a lot more money for these women to really do their own thing. And then we commit to buying it as a premium because you don't have the middle, middle person anymore. It goes down there. And last but not the least, which is also very important, this idea of women empowerment, you can do it by talking or you can do it by really resourcing it. We partnered with the USAID. I say this because there are opportunities. When you're doing the right thing, people like to come along. We partnered with USAID. The first savings, village savings and loan in Madagascar that we created for women so that they can take the loan was co-sponsored by uh, USAID. But look at what McCormick did. We paid the interest on the loan upfront. So when these women, and by the way, some men, we're not excluding men, when these women sold their crop to us at a premium, they paid back the loan without the interest. By the way, that was the turning point. And now they are thriving. They can send their kids to school by earning income once or twice a year. They can live through the, uh, uh, you know, the lean season, which is when money dries out. That's where we are at this point. And for me, that's an extension of the conversation on living wage because you got to think about those billion dollar, billion uh, uh, people that are really not earning a living wage. Thank you very much. Michael, thank you for painting such a, a vibrant picture there and really bringing in that gender angle to the picture, talking about how you get more connected with the farmers, removing the, the middlemen that, that, that are stripping money out along the way as well. Really practical examples. Catherine, I want to come to you next, but I know just before I do, we actually have a very short video that's going to give us a little bit of a backdrop to your remarks. So I'd invite our tech team to show us that. Multiple levers have to be applied to improve, enable farmers to achieve living income, like agricultural, market, financial, and basic livelihood services. Katrina, thank you for sharing that with us. So much resonant with what uh, Michael was telling us before as well. You're the Chief Sustainability Officer at DSM Fermanich. So just share a little bit more with us, if you would, about the work you've been doing around contractors and into that supply chain situation and perhaps also the benefits you've been seeing as a company from the work on living wages. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. Thank you for having me and thank you everybody for, for joining this uh, very important conversation. And with the video, I really wanted to say that the uh, actions uh, talk louder than, than commitments. So I really wanted to, to show you that what we're talking about here today, this is what the companies actually all do. And perhaps also to try to highlight the complexity of Sometimes you think that a living income or a living wage, uh, particularly in the farming uh, context, a living income is not as simple, just pay a bit more. Because uh, what's really important for us is that we are building a resilient supply chain. A supply chain where the farmer earns a living income, 
but for which we also get the supply that we need. So just by throwing money at, at, at the problem doesn't necessarily achieve that. It's also for us very important that the farmer uh, is competitive in a competitive environment and uh, that they can stand on their own feet so that we don't create a hostage situation in the project that we, we run. So therefore, those four elements that you heard, uh, that, uh, this uh, project in India, that's a jasmine uh, a sourcing project. So jasmine goes into some of our essential oils. And uh, so on those four dimensions, uh, agricultural services, so it's very much about helping the farmer to, to run his farm more uh, uh, effectively, to then be more profitable, uh, perhaps use different inputs, use different farming methods, just help them improve the, the farming operation. There's a financial aspect uh, was mentioned by my colleague as well. Uh, very often access to fine, uh, funding is, is, a, is a problem. So helping with, with loans so that the farmers can invest, sometimes very small scale, but still keep uh, evolving their own operation. There is uh, also market access. As we heard, there are typically very many middlemen that you could argue sometimes for a reason, sometimes actually just adding cost that should be actually be redistributed in that, that value chain. And then last but not least, as was also mentioned in, in the video, sometimes there are very fundamental needs, uh, healthcare, sometimes as something as fundamental as access to water. So you really need to think about that farm holistically in order to get to that living income and particularly to getting to that living income in a sustainable way. So that when the project is over, it's still there and, and the farmer is, is competitive. Obviously, we uh, see a lot of, of benefits. That's the biggest one being the obvious uh, uh, living income for the farmer. As was said by my colleagues, uh, I don't think anyone of us want to live in a society where we are dependent on people who can't make a, a, a decent living. Uh, second, as I said, it has actually improved a supply. In many cases, uh, with all these efforts uh, that goes into the project, we see an improvement in quality. Uh, we see an improvement in security of supply. All of this has a value that can be redistributed in that value chain. We work very closely together with uh, customers, some of them here on the panel today. Also gives the, our customers a reassurance that if they make a claim related to the raw materials they are using, we can actually verify uh, uh, where they're coming from, what are the conditions, so that the, nobody would uh, feel exposed to, that they believed the situation to be, be different. So all of this, I think, is uh, comes together to to a couple of things. I think the first one is also help shape the, the conversation. It was mentioned earlier uh, today that these are not simple concepts. So I think we all have to collaborate to keep uh, uh, working towards definitions that we understand in the same way so that we have, can measure our um, impacts. To collaborate uh, in, in a project like this, this is not something you do alone. You need uh, partners on the ground, but particularly you need to work in that value chain. And uh, last but not least, I would really want to say that the one thing that matters is action. So that is how we want to bring progress to life. Fantastic, Katarina, really sort of painting that holistic picture of understanding the ecosystem, human and other that you're working within and emphasizing that angle about financial flows as well, but then bringing out those resilience um, benefits for your own supply chains and, and, and the various ways that flows flows onwards. Well, you, you talk there very constructively about the complexities and the challenges, and I think we hear that in, in various ways, but as a challenge to let's get on and let's collaborate at solving them rather than use them as a reason not to get started. So before I come to my last two speakers, we're going to run another quick poll of all of you in the audience and ask you again to go into Slido and uh, reflect on in your own experience and based on what you've heard, what would you see as the main barriers to paying a living wage, whether we're thinking about employees or contractors or uh, into the supply chain. And while you're doing that, I'll just make a note about some uh, work that we, Shift, have launched today with the Capitals Coalition. Uh, we've been working over the last two and a half years, uh, collaborating with all of the major living wage initiatives to come up with a simple and standardized way in which companies can measure and report on their progress towards living wage, not just are you above or below, but really measuring that journey. And so um, we've produced an accounting model. We've worked with accounting experts around this um, where you can input data and find metrics that show that progress. So I invite you to go and see shiftproject.org. You should see it pop up on the front page, the accounting for living wage 
um, uh, tool and uh, you can link there and see more. Later this year, we will be issuing an actual tool that enables you to download it, customize it, input your data and see those metrics on progress towards living wages come up. And around employees, our, our methodology there in this is indeed the ways in which our first target uh, under these living wage targets of the Global Compact and Forward Faster are going to be measured. So do have a look at that, but I'm looking forward to seeing the results coming up here. If uh, we can get a quick look at what our audience is telling us about the experience on barriers as we approach living wages. Let's see some results if we can from our Slido colleagues. And maybe as that's coming up, perhaps, um, Rebecca, let me turn to yourself. You're the Chief Sustainability Officer with uh, Unilever, and Unilever has been on this living wage journey for some while. You started uh, with your own workforce, and now you're doing work pushing that into supply chain partnerships. We can see there the results coming up of what our audience sees as critical barriers. Awareness and understanding is clearly coming up as the, the first of those. Uh, what is the concept of living wages and having not had the discussions around that, but also uh, some recognition of others of these barriers. But share with us, if you would, um, a little bit about the challenges you at Unilever have met along the way of this journey and perhaps how you've overcome some of those along the way as well. Thank you. So. Uh all of the barriers that were up on the Slido are things that we have experienced a hundred percent. It's really difficult. So I think what we always try to do at Unilever, our strategy across the sustainability sphere is get your own house in order. Then you work through your, your value chain, through your brands, and then out into the wider ecosystem. So I think that that first part, you know, I, I thought when we started the journey in, in 2014, oh yeah, we'll, we'll, you know, we'll be paying living wage. So that's the easy part internally. It took us six years to be 100% certain that we were definitely paying living wage because you need to get the data ready internally and maybe there's a central number that might not be exactly the same as the number that somebody has in a country and so on and so forth. So you know, that really is, is, is the first barrier in, in getting your own house in order. And I think you, you talked about it, Alexandra, making sure you've got senior level buying and support as well because of course, when you first say it, there's quite a bit of trepidation of, well, you know, we want to do that, but how will we possibly afford it? I mean, it's be really, really expensive. It's commercially viable for us. So you know, getting your own house in order is, is, is the first barrier to overcome. Then the second part is working through your value chain and, and, and working with your suppliers. So understanding where's the footprint, where can you make the biggest difference? And actually, I think you need to have a roadmap. And I worked really closely with procurement in order to be able to identify which geography should we start in? Where's the biggest gap currently between minimum wage and living wage? I think that point that came top in your uh, in your study as well is then the, the next barrier of, it's really complicated because you ask people and they say, oh no, we, yeah, well, of course we, we comply with the government. You know, that's that's a minimum wage. And there is, there's real complexity, I think, around the terms. And I know ILO next year are, come, are bringing out a, um, or hope they will, already brought this out but but really ramping up the awareness around definitions and methodology so that it's a topic that people feel um is easier for them to engage on and i think you know that that basic understanding is is, is really really important then i think the next part of that is agreeing your baseline uh, and your methodology i can see you've got wage indicator um up there and, and thanks to, to a number of the colleagues and organizations here this is something that Unilever and many others have been a part of to try and make this information that the pay data available in the public sector because getting the right baseline and being able to measure that is really important because otherwise you can't turn your promises into action. You, you need access to that information and making that freely available is, is really important. So you've got a benchmark in place. And then I think the last part is, you know, I mentioned the sort of outer layer of, of how we approach our strategy is in the wider ecosphere. So, you know, I, I felt, I was gonna say this week, I'm actually on day two, it feels like I've been here ages, but, but you know, lots of conversations are, around climate. Um, and I think that's now very much understood and accepted and you know, the, the world is trying to move towards, towards decarbonization. But actually we need that same level of ambition around living wage as well. And really pushing this much more into the public domain, getting companies to talk about it, 
you know, I'm starting to see, as I'm sure many of you are, more investors asking questions about this as they as they have started with climate over the past couple of years. But you know, pushing companies on on living wage, I think from investors is really important. Getting it onto government policy, really pushing from an advocacy perspective as well, galvanizing action across the private sector so that actually you are leveling the playing field and you're not just relying on some of the front runner companies to, to do this, but Actually, everyone's doing that and, and you're pushing this agenda forward and it becomes much more um, common parlance in, in, in the business world and within the business ecosystem. So obviously, you know, listing through that, that, that selection of topics, there are barriers to get there. But equally, I think there are solutions to overcome all of those barriers. And, you know, we've heard the panel talk about some of them today. And I would agree as well with, with everyone here. I think just get started on the journey you know, because you can become paralyzed with wanting to get the perfect data in place and making sure you've got the right bonus. Once you get started, it, it, it starts to galvanize action. You reach out to the suppliers that you know will come with you on the journey. And then you go to the next batch of suppliers and you start on your advocacy globally. And then you start in the key countries and, and so on and so forth. And I think if you break it down and get very granular, you do start to see progress. Such a, a valuable message indeed, yes. It prioritize, start somewhere, get moving. Great to hear from where you are in your journey, the challenges you've encountered, met and passed through, as well as the ones you know, you're now grappling with as, as you go forward. Um, and you know, so pertinent, you raised there the point about convergence of methodologies and transparency around what those living wage estimates and benchmarks are. So Fiona, it's fantastic to have you here with us as the Director of Wage Indicator and part of the consortium that's been coming together around this new initiative for a wage map. Please take a little bit of time, to tell us about wage map. Thanks a lot, everybody. And thanks a lot for the Global Compact as well to give us the space uh, to talk here today. I'm really happy to see the panel that shows social partners as well as companies and uh, our collective effort together because it shows the importance within the living wage movement to have all of these actors together to work on making living wage payments a reality, right? So um, I'm happy to not only present Wage Indicator, my own organization here today, but actually a collective and a new collaboration of organizations that you see on the slide here. Um, we will be launching uh, officially today our wage map collaboration, uh, which is a new collaboration of data providers, living wage data providers, as well as service providers that work around and support companies uh, by close, with closing the living wage gap within their own operations, as well as in their supply chain. And uh, we have a couple of goals which with an ultimate mission to close the living wage gap, of course. Uh, but in the meantime, what we try to do is we try to uh, align uh, our our line and harmonize our methodologies, our definitions on uh, how we speak about living wage, what is included in the basket. And uh, we are uh, working towards preparing a standardized methodology or a standard um, in which all of those discussions come together, uh, with which we hope we can clarify um, much better uh, what a living wage is. And as such, also have all of the publicly available data sets that are out there uh, be part of that standard as, as such that we can show uh, which data best aligns with the standard that we have then collectively agreed on together, obviously with stakeholders. Um, I would like to emphasize that uh, today marks the beginning of our collective journey. Um, it's very much a stakeholder effort uh, in which we hope uh, and also invite companies, trade unions, uh, em well, employers, governments, and other civil society organizations, and especially also local living wage movements to join our effort and join our discussions because it's meant to be an open collaboration um, in which we uh, together try and close the living wage gap. Um, and uh, yeah, I think today marks the beginning of an exciting journey, but we do want to move fast. So we see it as a running train <laughs> of which we hope everybody will jump on it. Fantastic, Fiona. It's, it's genuinely exciting to see that happening. I think so many in this arena, companies and others have been hankering for more clarity, more convergence around what constitutes credible living wage estimates. And so that's really a, a valuable development we'll follow with great interest. I want to just come back very briefly. I'm going to ask each of our panel members to take 30 seconds and just leave the audience with what would your number one message, your number one takeaway be for companies looking to be part of this movement towards living wages? Rebecca, you're holding a mic, so I'm going to come first to you and ask you to share your, your final takeaway. Uh, 
start with your own organization and then make a pledge to work through your supply chain and beyond. Fantastic. Alexandra. Yeah, that that is of course true, but it seems really the beginning of everything in, in every field of sustainability to to make your house. I, I think I'm, you know, it is about how do we how do we get the leadership we need because as I said in the beginning for me, for me this is really a question of uh, what kind of society and what kind of businesses we want to build and um, that would be more the, the, the high level perspective and the other thing that I think was really really true in the panel is start get it done because we have in all okay. sustainability conversations yeah, I'm sorry okay for my crane I wish we have some an interference here. Somebody is <laughs> integrating our conversation. That's interesting. So, um, no, I think that may start to get it done and not let people tell us, because we have that on a lot of sustainability issues, the, the data, the exact, uh, you know, uh, some a lot of things can be done before we need that excellence in the last perfect mile. Okay. And I think that is uh, that was a very important message here. Thank you. Thank you, Alexandra. Katerina, your last takeaway. I think I would like to echo uh, the, the message of uh, get started, uh, go for action rather than perfection. Uh, we can easily hide by, behind unclear definitions, all of that. I think it was brought up by several panelists. Let not that get in the way. We all know what we need to do. Let's get started. Let's get started. Michael. Uh, thanks. Um, my message is very simple because um, if you are in the agricultural supply chain, it's a very simple message, and I'll put it as a question. Do you want to have an enduring supply chain? Because if you don't, you don't have a business. So this is an existential issue. So what am I saying is get going because that's where you create an enduring supply chain, an enduring business. Thank you. Thank you, and Sami, round us out here. Uh, I widen it a bit. There are three companies relying on agriculture in our supply chain or forestry. And remember it, it's a local issue. But at the same time, if you actually are paying living income for those farmers and so on, you actually are enhancing biodiversity at the same time. There's always win-win. Fantastic. Well, ladies and gentlemen, we're going to keep you for, for just five minutes more. I know we've pushed just a little bit into your lunch break, but we brought you, I'm sure you'll agree, a really rich set of conversations today. So first of all, please join me in thanking our panelists for bringing that perspective. Thank you. Yep. Thank you. Good. And, and as we all exit the stage, um, I'll invite Dan Vensing to come up uh, here for some closing remarks. Dan is the CEO uh, and chair of IDH, a leading sustainable trade initiative and a key partner to the UN Global Compact in this work on living wages. So down the stage is yours. Yeah. Thank you and good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. A real pleasure to be here. And let me start actually by congratulating the UN Global Compact with the great initiative that was launched this week uh, on five very important themes. Um, so again, great also as IDH to be one of the signatories and to really support the efforts and luckily many on the stage today and in the audience have also signed up and are moving forward. Um, and I think that's also the, the main thing. I mean, we've heard from the various panelists of what they are doing, um, new tools being developed, testing it in, in value chains. Um, but at the same time, we also realized that um, we're only at the beginning of the, of the journey. I think Rebecca also mentioned it, right? That, okay, how can we build that movement um, and, and that is very much needed. If, if I look at the work of IDH that is now also very much in support of what the UN Global Compact is, is doing, um, then we build a coalition of indeed unions, of employers, of um, uh, certifiers, of civil society, many organizations working together on issues like living wage and living income, coming up with a very practical roadmap of not only how to map the gaps, but also then how to really take action. But if we're really honest, then it's only a very small group that is really moving beyond this. Um, there is a certain sector where we're operating in, and I'm not going to mention that sector, which was not represented on the stage today, where we, over the last couple of months, have been engaging them on the subject of living wage. And the answer was very simple. No, we're not starting it, because it will 
as for some of uh, what the panelists said, is going to put us out of business, right? The sector is under a lot of constraint. Um, and if we start paying more uh, and nobody else does, then we're out of business. So that, you know, and these are the front runners in that sector and they don't want to move on the subject. So again, I think also what comes from the discussion today is we really need to be doing this together. Um, yesterday at the private sector forum of the UN Global Compact, uh, the UN Secretary General spoke and he was of course reflecting on, well, the dire state of our progress on the sustainable development goals. And he said, we really need the public and the private, right? 30% can come from the public, 70% needs to come from the private, but you really need the two of them to make it work. And as an organization that is all about public-private partnership, I, I can only agree to that. I mean, we can ask the private sector to move forward, but then you're gonna get the same answer, right? Only those with the deepest pockets, that the highest commitments, they will start moving and all the rest will sit back and wait. And then listening also to the representatives this morning of, of representing workers, we can't have that anymore, right? I mean, we're in 2023 and we have so many people that, you know, are working and are in poverty. And that I'm not even talking about farming. In farming, it's even worse. Um, so let's really take that forward in a public-private collaboration to really get that scale. And it's great that the UN is throwing its weight behind it also through its agencies like the ILO, because that's really what we need to, uh, to move this agenda forward. So that's what I wanna leave you with, a real call to action, moving this forward, do this in collaboration, but let's not indeed not having all the data stole us. Get going, get engaging, but also don't forget, I mean, we're having this beautiful conversation in a huge building here in New York City. Um, but if I look at the work we're doing in the banana sector, where we've convened the retail sector in various European countries to come up with a commitment to close living wage gaps, not only for their own employees, but also very much in the supply chain. Actually, at the beginning of that value chain, the producers are now starting like, hey, you know, what is it all about? And, you know, we really need social dialogue here because before you know it, we become too expensive and then people start sourcing from our competitors or they go to a different country. And I think it is indeed that complexity that we also very much need to take into account and we really need to talk indeed to those really at the beginning of the value chain because we can have a great understanding here, but if that doesn't work in the reality um, in some of, uh, of those countries, then we're not solving any problem and we're probably only making it, uh, making it worse. So let's keep our eyes open, let's really go for the dialogue and at the same time be very pragmatic in terms of how we move forward. So I think all our panelists spoke to that, you know, keep going, keep learning, keep engaging in the company, in the sector and very much also in that public-private dialogue. So I'll leave you with that as a parting thought. I wish you a great rest of your conference and week. And um, yeah, we'll be in touch. Thanks very much.